Mr. Well, Mr. Stamps. Why are you wearing your safety glasses? We're sitting at a desk. Because last time when we did experiments, yeah. you did not wear your safety glasses. Right, but we're at a desk. Yeah, but we're going to do experiments. We're scientists, and you're not wearing your safety glasses. What's up with that? Well, I'm at a desk. <laughs> but I'm prepared. Oh, I, I see. I am prepared for the experiment you don't we're doing. You like a fool like I did last time without yes, having mine on. Yes, he was being the oh, fool yeah, he was not okay. supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So today, last uh, the last section, electrolysis and a little practice uh, problems here. Yeah. So uh, let's kind of go on this. Electrolysis. Okay. We've been learning about uh, galvanic cells that are batteries. Yes. But there's something that's opposite. Yeah. They're called the electrolytic cells. Yep. But in this case, we're going to pump electricity through a non-what? Spontaneous. Because with our galvanic cells, you hook them up and they go because there's the spontaneous reaction. These ones don't go. You can only make them go if you add things together. Yeah, to and they're just the thing. reverse of the spontaneous reactions that normally go. All right. Just shove so electricity. So let's do a compare and contrast. The first picture is the picture of a galvanic cell. Yep. Well, cell. <laughs> so that's the galvanic cell. And notice that here the voltage here is a positive 1 volts. And if we go over here, we have a different reaction. They have a power source right here, and they're adding 1 volts, and it drives the electrons in the opposite, opposite direction. direction. This is actually the basis of a rechargeable battery, mm -hmm. is that you can get the batteries to work in opposite directions. So when you take your cell phone with its rechargeable battery and you plug it in, you are causing the reaction to go in the opposite direction. Yes. So it's very cool how all this works. All right? All right, before we do this, let's kind of uh, define some terms. Now, an electrolytic cell, what is the definition of an electrolytic cell? This is where you use electricity to what? Produce a chemical change. Produce, pro, P R O D, D U C E, a chemical change. Now, that's the opposite of a, of a galvanic cell because in the galvanic cell, we have a chemical change used to produce electricity. That's right. And electrolysis, particularly, is what? Now, that's a little bit kind of right, a that's special you, case. That's what we are just talking about, where you force the current through the cell to make that happen. So force the current to produce. How is that different than um, electrolytic cell? Well, the electrolysis is the process we use to make the electrolytic cell work. Yeah, so this is really the process, and it, the electrolytic cell is a device that makes right. it work. Okay. Yeah. Now, when we do this, we also measure a particular unit we haven't talked about, and that is... Um, an uh, amp. amp or an ampere, yep. named after some guy named Mr. Amp, I think. Um, and an amp measures essentially the current flow. It's yes. also called the current. Now, where have you heard current before? Uh, in the ocean. Yeah, there's ocean currents, or maybe possibly like the there's a if there's a river flowing, you can measure yeah. how or fast that, the that river place flows. That place springs that sells greeting cards and checks. No. No different? I think it's something okay. different. You're all silly, Mr. Ah, Sammys. No, all right. So a current is actually how fast the electrons flow. So we measure that in something called a coulomb per second. A coulomb per second is an amp. So if you have one coulomb per second, then it's one amp, or five coulombs per second, five, amp, five amps, et cetera. Yep. Now, Faraday, we learned about this last time, but you'll see it's kind of important. Um, in this uh, particular unit or this uh, podcast, there's 96,485 coulombs for every one mole of electrons. We'll need this when we do the math here yes. in a little bit. Now, electrolysis, this is pretty cool. Um, this is a picture of electrolysis. There's a battery right here, and we can, you know, Mr. Sams, I wonder we if that? we could do this for them. Let's hook it up and see what them. happens. Yeah. All right, folks, what we've got going on here is I have a uh, beaker. And in that beaker, I have two test tubes filled with water. Now, one thing I did do is I made sure that I added some salt to the water because it won't work unless, because water doesn't conduct electricity. However, the salt does, okay? And then I have it connected. There's a wire. If you look way down in here where my fingers are, it's kind of got some bubbles in it. But you can see a, a wire on both sides. These are my, my anode and my cathode. This actually doesn't require two separate cells, but I think it's cool if you have two separate cells. And then over here, I have a power supply. It says AC-DC power supply. And, um, like the band? Like the band. And so if I turn this on... Okay, so what should be happening right now is that we should be getting um, power coming through our system. And I'm not seeing why it's not working. Oh, there we go. So everybody, if you look, I forgot I put the wrong power. If you look on this particular cell, you'll see a gas being given off. You see the bubbles? And they're rising to the top. And on this side, you should also see the gas given off, but it looks like there's, it's harder to see it. It's going at about, I can see it. Maybe if we turn this around, you can see it. 
Yeah. All right. All right. Mr. Bergman will see if he can get the, the bubbles out. The way. By the way, don't stick your finger in that water right now. I don't think that would be a good idea. No. All right, I can see the bubbles right here where my finger is pointing, yep, and definitely. this is producing a gas. And if you zoom into the top, you'll notice that we're producing a gas right here. Now, this one is producing at twice the rate as this. Since this is water, this is separating water. This is the electrolysis of water. All right, electrolysis just means splitting by electricity. And so I am producing hydrogen in this particular tube and oxygen in this tube. And the reason I know that is because this is being produced at twice the rate of this one. And so in H2O, you'll make twice as much hydrogen as you will oxygen. So this is the electrolysis of water. Um, you could do this with lots of other things, and let's we'll talk about that in just a moment when we go back to our podcast. So let's see. So you can see, here's a picture. The picture probably, we saw it live in action, but if you look at this picture, this would be the hydrogen side right here. Uh, might probably need a darker pen, I think. Um, this would be the hydrogen side, and this would be the oxygen side. So we got to see it live instead of just a just a boring picture. Picture. Okay. Let me tell you a little story. Tell actually, us a story, Mr. Actually, Bergman. before we do the story, let me tell you about my interesting story about um, electrolysis. So I'm in college. And Did you stick your finger in. No. Oh. That'd I'm in college, and I get this uh, field trip to this place, and what they do is they're plating chrome, a chrome plating factory. Like You've bumpers heard of, and stuff? Like bumpers and stuff. Yeah. And um, the number of amps that they would run through this thing was like 100,000 amps. So they could, they'd, so they had this big cell. By the way, if you get electrocuted, it's not the volts that kill you. It's the amps. Yeah. And so there was this huge thing that was the size of a car, this big buck, filled with potassium dichromate. By the way, that's a very nasty chemical. Yeah, dichromate's icky. So it's orange. So it was orange. That's an AP question, by the way. What color is dichromate? It's orange. And then they would stick into their, their device, and they would have it hooked up to some metals, and uh, the dichromate would plate onto chromium. And it was like 100,000 volts. I mean, if you touch that solution, dead. You die. Volts or amps? Um, 100,000 amps. Yeah, yeah, it was – Wow. this was the biggest electricity user in the county, I guess, uh, <laughs> um, these guys. And then, of course, I found out later on that these guys got put on the Superfund site. Ooh. <laughs> you see, because they had this that thing called – That means big toxic mess. Because this dichromate, even though it chrome-plated things and it made it pretty and you could chrome-plate things like milk things and it made it very safe, the extra dichromate got like thrown into their backyard, so Oops. to speak. And then the EPA got in – and found out that they were dumping in the backyard, and Oops. the company went out of business. Gee, you think? Yeah, bad news. So mm. it was very cool to go there. However, I didn't know they were doing unsafe practices and polluting the world. So anyways, side note. Another interesting story. Um, aluminum. Aluminum, uh, this is a guy named Charles Martin It's like Hall. he's about 16. And actually, he was about 16 when he did this. And um, the price of aluminum in 1855... 100,000 bucks a pound. $100,000 per pound. By the way, little, another side note. I don't know if you're going to talk about this. The top of the Washington Monument in, in um, uh, Washington, D.C., they put a, a they put an aluminum cap on it because they finished building it in the 1800s, shortly after the Civil War. They put an aluminum cap on it basically to signify, hey, we've got this really expensive metal. we got money to burn because we're an up-and-coming country. We're going to cap the Washington Monument with aluminum. Whoa. Yeah. That's because it costs $100,000 exactly. a pound. Exactly. Well, it turns out there's, like, oh. there's this dude, Charles Martin Hall, this yeah. guy right here. and he we'll was call a, him Chuck. He was a uh, – Chucky. And he was a student at Oberlin College. And uh, basically his professor said, if you can figure out how to convert, get aluminum – and make it cheap because aluminum aluminum oxide Al203 is very very present all over the world. Yeah, it's just bauxite. It's one of the most abundant things in the crust of the earth. However, they couldn't figure out how to make it into like aluminum so that you could you know put it on the top of the monument. Yeah. they did, but it cost a hundred thousand dollars. And so basically, he went to his shed one summer. So he was just a college student, like like you know probably about this age. We could get a couple of whiskers. Yeah, I don't know if he had any whiskers. He was so young, Three and so he was working desk. in the shed in the backyard with um, like uh, mason jars for batteries, and figured out how to make aluminum. Cool. And uh, became like uber rich. Uh huh. In fact, he formed I think the com the company Alcola, um, which makes aluminum like everything. Yeah. They're like uber rich, and so he became this super rich kid because he figured out how to do this. Cool. So it's and so it's called the. Uh, the Hall-Herolt process, 
Um, because actually, interestingly enough, simultaneously there was this German dude who figured out how to do it, and they figured out the same thing, and they never talked to each other. So now it's called huh. the hall Horow process. Kind of like the whole who discovered oxygen thing. Yeah. Happened in the same time in different parts of the world. Or calculus, for that matter, yeah. 